Before I get to the admit, I guess we should probably get started. I just, I would like to remind the residents that uh, Dr. Clark is going to be giving a little slide seminar and a little discussion following this, so we'll, we'll reconvene over in the uh, uh, Benson conference room, I guess. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce John Franco. We're sort of cycling through people who started uh, residency with me. Uh, so we're about two-thirds of the way through. I'm going to have to expand our pool of speakers. Uh, but John, John is a really remarkable person who's now holds the title of the uh, Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs at Washington University's Professor of Both Pathology and Gynecology, which tells he's still, um, you know, in his spare time signing out gynecology cases. And, uh, Running the molecular pathology fellowship, I guess, in, in, in off hours or something, but he's obviously a very busy and accomplished person. And he's going to talk about uh, the genomic pathology service and next gen sequencing and how that can be used in clinical medicine. <clears throat> well, thank you for that kind introduction. I am um, I'm very happy that you invited uh, me up here to talk. I actually had relatives in the uh, Minneapolis area when I was growing up in, in Coon Rapids, and so I've been here a few times. And it's every time I come here, it seems like it's snowing. And so that's why you're getting a main first snowstorm. I think I brought that with me. <clears throat> so what I want to talk today about is next generation sequencing to direct the care of oncology patients in routine practice. And <clears throat> sort of the one sentence summary of all of that is that everybody knows that there are these next generation sequencing techniques out there. And everybody uses them in the basic science laboratory. And about three and a half years ago, um, the chairman of pathology and the chairman of genetics, and genetics at WashU is a preclinical department. It's not medical genetics. It's one of the preclinical basic science departments. And I got together and said, you know, we should do this clinically, that we should explore um, the opportunity to do this clinically. And so we put about two years of development into that in terms of getting the right platforms, putting together our bioinformatics, and then we went live about 18 months ago. And so what I want to talk with you today about is the, the application of next generation sequencing, again, to direct um, patient care, routine practice. So, you know, it's, it's the future is now. It's, it's not something that we're talking about doing. We're actually doing it now. So here is um, the required uh, disclosure statement. <clears throat> we, meaning uh, GPS, Genomics and Pathology Services at WashU, we have vendor-client relationships, and, and we also includes me with Illuminate with these companies. Now these are companies obviously that make the platforms, that market the platforms to, um, to do the sequencing. Uh, they're companies that uh, market the chemistry to do, to do the sequencing. I will talk about them today. I'm not actually, I don't get any money from any of these companies. Um, I have no specific uh, individual interest in these companies. And when I talk about them today, it's simply to use names to tell you the companies that we use. Uh, it's not an endorsement. And if I don't mention somebody, it's not an anti-endorsement. It's just these are the companies we're using. And so in full disclosure, I'll tell you their names. This is an interesting part of the disclosures as well. I work for Washington University School of Medicine. And it turns out that, like you folks, I work at an academic tertiary care urban medical center. This is just as much of a bias as what I'm going to say today as anything that would have to do with the company that, that I may happen to mention in passing. Also. GPS is not funded by the University of the School of Medicine, right? That is as big of a bias as anything I'm going to say today. GPS was started using the, um, the reserves, using the, the, the money from the Department of Pathology and the Department of Genetics, all right? We have received today a grand total of zero dollars and zero cents from either the Dean of the School of Medicine or from the university directly. We don't have a war chest of 10 or 40 million dollars to do this. All right, we have had to fund this out of, again, departmental resources. Now, what that means is that what I'm going to tell you today is very, very focused on setting up a sequencing operation that is financially sustainable from the get-go. All right? We didn't have the luxury, as some other institutions do, of having this war chest of tens of millions of dollars where we could explore genome-wide sequencing or exome-wide sequencing and do tumor normal pairs and not worry about where the money was going to come from. From the very beginning, we had to develop a model in terms of our clinical service, the, the test menu, that would allow us to get reimbursed for the testing we do. So what I'm going to tell you today is not truth, okay? What it is is um, the way that we have addressed the, the informatic, the wet lab, and the uh, reimbursement issues that arise when you try to do this clinically. 
So it's important to, under, to, to, to not to generalize or overgeneralize what I'm going to tell you today and walk away from this thinking um, small gene panels or medium-sized gene panels are the only way to go. That's not necessarily true. I'm not saying doing paired exomes, tumor normal paired exomes, is not the way to go. It's just that we have had to pursue test, a test menu that allows us to get paid for what we do. Okay, so this is uh, this is a very important disclosure as well. So here's that was the requisite disclaimer side slide. Here are the requisite um, CME goals and objectives. Now, <clears throat> for those of you who came hoping to hear uh, a lecture comparing and contrasting the various platforms for doing the sequencing and the various chemistries, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that today. All right. If you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. I can point you in the direction of some really good reviews about that. But I'm assuming that everybody in the audience understands, at least in general terms, that there are these platforms that allow you to, to generate um, in the range of 10 to 20 billion bases of sequence, okay, billion bases of sequence in a 24-hour period. And just to put that um, in the appropriate context, most of you are familiar with this book that was written by, uh, by Juan Rosai and, and Ackerman, okay? So that two-volume set, <clears throat> so if you were to stack <clears throat> Nine of those two volume sets um, on top of one another, that would give you your genome, your haplogenome. That would be about 3 billion characters. So that puts in, into um, perspective what um, 10 to 20 billion bases overnight really is. It's a huge amount of volume, a huge amount of sequence. As I say to everybody, the good news when you get into this field is that you can make 10 or 20 billion base pairs of sequence overnight. The bad news is you can make 10 or 20 billion base pairs of sequence overnight because then you have all that data you need to analyze. So I'm not going to talk about any of that. Um, I'm assuming you folks understand um, that, that these, tech, um, these platforms exist. And I'm not going to talk about the different ways to design an assay. Okay, that's something we can talk about also, whether you use a hybrid capture-based methodology, amplification-based methodology, and on and on. Instead, what I'm going to do is focus on what we've learned at GPS regarding the clinical application of next generation sequencing in a CLIA environment as a component of direct patient care that is reimbursed. Now, that's a mouthful. And I want to walk through the four parts of that last sentence because they actually crystallize what the message is I'm going to try and transmit to you guys today. Regarding the clinical application of NGS, we are not doing NGS at GPS in a basic science setting. And, well, it turns out we are. We do support some grants. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk with you today about what we did for the clinical application. All right? And what that means is the way we met the regulatory hurdles, the way we address the things that insurance companies are going to want, in order that we can use these results to actually impact the care of patients in a clean environment. <clears throat> okay, so what the testing we're doing is in a CAP, you know, a CAP credit clean license laboratory. This is a little stale now. As you all know, um, last June, CAP came up with their revised molecular uh, testing checklist, and they have the, um, the, the series of um, things that you have to do in a CLIA lab that, uh, or, or the series of requirements are there as part of that molecular checklist. Again, that came out uh, about a year ago. We were already well over two or two and a half years into this uh, before CAP gave us any guidance. And so we ended up doing a lot of work trying to understand um, how to validate this assay before there was any guidance out there. But again, we're doing it in a clean environment now. As a component of direct patient care, okay, meaning the results that we produce go on the patient's chart and they are used as a basis for therapy. All right. Now, this is where a lot of people get, get sort of confused in all of this. Next generation sequencing is a technique for DNA sequencing. Okay, next generation sequencing. There's nothing magical here. People have a tendency to think that next generation sequencing automatically means you're doing a whole genome, automatically means you're doing a transcription or methylome. That's not true. It's simply a way to make DNA sequence. There are some of us in this room who are old enough to have done Max and Gilbert sequencing, okay, back in the day, who then were very excited when dideoxy sequencing uh, came along. Uh, Dr. Sanger invented that. It's interesting that Max and Gilbert sequencing um, you know, led to a Nobel Prize, and dioxin sequencing led to a Nobel Prize, and, and someone will probably um, win a similar prize for this. It speaks to how important understanding or being able to quickly and accurately sequence DNA. But don't be intimidated by next generation sequencing. All it is is a way to make DNA sequence. All right? Where it, it becomes so interesting is because it can make so much sequence at the same time, 
that allows you to ask questions or design assets that you simply couldn't design before. The other part about next generation sequencing is the data that comes off of the sequencing machines is what I like to refer to as digital. All right? With Sanger sequencing, you get an electropharogram that is the composite sequence of the millions of molecules that you actually did the sequence analysis of. And with the next generation sequencing approaches, you get the sequence of individual molecule by individual molecule by individual molecule. And that allows you to do a lot more sophisticated bioinformatics on it. And it allows you with appropriate bioinformatics to markedly increase the sensitivity and the specificity of your assay. On the downside, you get a tremendous amount of data. And so you end up having to call through essentially a lot of unimportant stuff to find the stuff that you're really interested in. Okay? So other methods can also be used to evaluate panels of genes, right? We all know that you can do multiplex PCR and so on. What we wanted to do is explore whether we could use next generation sequencing to find, to, to evaluate panels of genes. And the reason we were interested in doing this, as you all know, there are a large number of targeted chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agents that are being developed. And we said, well, not only do we have a technique that can sequence a lot of genes at the same time, but there's actually an emerging clinical need to do it. And so that was one of the reasons that we were interested in actually exploring the application of this clinically. Um, there were some novel regulatory issues. And then here at the very bottom, the caboose on the train, is we wanted to be able to get reimbursed to do the testing. And this is the theme I'm going to keep coming back to. Because at GPS, we have to get paid for the work that we do. And so if you're looking for a very you know, deep insight for me as to how we address this issue, you, again, you're not going to get that from me. I have a very straightforward answer, which is what GPS did. We said... Here are the genes that insurance companies are already paying to get the sequence from. So all we're going to do is sequence the same genes by this new technology. We can do it cheaper because there are some efficiencies here once you get to sets of genes or gene panels. All right? And we can do it, our, one of our early models was at least as well as Sanger, at least as good as Sanger. So we have been able to show that we can get results that are at least as good as Sanger as far as sensitivity and specificity go. And, and virtually every time that we've optimized a, a, a bioinformatic pipeline, we're better than Sigma. Okay? But what we did is we started out by saying, okay, we want to be able to go to an insurance company and say, we want to get paid to have sequence BRAF. And they said, yeah, that's on our list of, of coverages. We'll pay you to do BRAF. We didn't go to the insurance companies and say, here's a, here's a panel of 150 or 200 genes that we want you to pay for. Because they, we knew they would have said, well, you know, there's only five genes or 20 genes we're going to pay for, and those other ones are research, we're not going to pay you. All right? So we focused very early on on a panel, on a set of genes that we knew we could get reimbursed for, because insurance companies were already paying um, for that sequence. So essentially, we went to the insurance companies and we said, <clears throat> pay us for the sequence, not for necessarily a Sanger methodology. Now, <clears throat> this is just an outline then of the way we set this up, so to set the landscape. So this is GPS. Now, this laboratory, okay, actually does a number of different things. We, um, we are always in the background doing research and panel development, right? We have a budget for developing new tests. And we also, in the background, since we're an academic medical center, are looking at genomic technologies and innovation. We're always looking at different platforms, trying to understand their sweet spot. This is what I'm going to talk with you today about, is the clinical testing we do. Part of the clinical <coughs> testing is driven by the bioinformatics group that we have. And then, of course, we have you know, residents and fellows um, at our institution um, as part of GPS. Now, this is a very big number. Over 150 faculty and staff support GPS. And that's true. In any given week, you could, as the samples that go through the lab, you could, uh, you know, with one degree of separation, point to 150 different people who touched that sample or in some way interacted with the sample. Well, these are all the people in the background that are doing things that are directly or indirectly related. In reality, when a sample comes through the lab, there are probably only about six or eight people who are involved in the lab. And those are the couple of technicians who make the libraries, a couple of bioinformatics people who move, the, move these large files through the bioinformatic process, and then there are those of us who actually sign out the cases. And at WashU, the people who sign out those cases, we sort of glibly refer to ourselves as the seven dwarves. Um, there are three of us who are pathologists, who are either AP or CP board certified, and who also have subspecialty boards in molecular genetic pathology. And there are four of us who come through the PhD route, who are ABMG um, boarded with subspecialty boards in molecular testing through ABMG. And that right there is a very interesting point. 
Um, there's a lot of worry out there that pathologists don't get involved in doing this, that, um, that other clinical laboratorians are going to take over this testing. The reality is in our shop, there aren't enough pathologists to do it. So we have actually had to hire people who are on PhD trained in order to provide the expertise to sign out these reports. Um, as of July, there will be four, four of us. We're hiring another person. This also speaks to our training programs. We currently have in our um, molecular genetic pathology training program, we currently have three fellows a year. We're, we're hoping next year to expand that up to four. We're credited for four. And we currently have three trainees in our ABMG, our CG, um, training program for molecular um, laboratory testing through the American Board of Medical Genetics. So one of the things that we recognized early on is we have to train the people to do this testing because there aren't enough pathologists out there um, to actually um, interpret these reports. And again, this is all built um, on the resources that are available um, at Washington University. We currently have, it's closer to 60,000 cases a year. And then we, um, we do all of this testing. This is a little out of date. We recently expanded to somewhere closer to 28,000 square feet. Now, this is another important point to make about all of this. Next generation sequencing in our lab the way we set it up does not exist in a vacuum. Um, <clears throat> we like to say to people that we have been doing genome-wide testing, the pathologists have been doing genome-wide testing for probably close to 50 years. We started with classical um, cyto cytogenetics. Um, you know, it's very low resolution, but it is, it is genome-wide. And then you move into microarrays. Well, microarrays have a higher resolution, they're genome-wide, but you know, resolution down probably into the tens of kilobases. Um, and all next generation, so then you get to Sanger sequencing, very high resolution, right? Single base pair resolution, but again, it's not genome wide, you're limited to do a couple hundred base pairs. And so all next generation sequencing is sort of the end game of all of this. It can be genome wide in this single base pair resolution. But in our laboratory, we have all of these things going on in exactly the same building in that same 28,000 square feet. We leverage them against one another because one of the lessons we learned quite early in this three years ago is next generation sequencing is just another lab test at the end of the day. It has a sweet spot, all right? There are lots of things you can do by next generation sequencing, but you probably shouldn't because it's a waste of time and money, all right? One of the things we are currently doing in our lab is actually investing a couple hundred thousand dollars over the next year to buff up our single gene testing, not necessarily senior, but single gene testing, because it just turns out there are still single genes that you have to analyze in next generation sequencing approaches just aren't a very efficient way to do that. So it works best when it's part of an integrated molecular, um, a molecular pathology laboratory. Now, it's very important also to understand that when you do clinical next generation sequencing, it is fundamentally different than the research next generation sequencing that most institutions are familiar with. And this is sort of a battle that we had to fight at WashU. A lot of people, including myself, had done uh, next generation sequencing for various research projects. And there's this sense that, oh, yeah, we'll just get clear licensure and then we'll be good to go. Like, what's the big deal? Right? And then two years later, we finally were be able to, you know, push the start button. These are the things along the way that we realized we had to do. For research next generation sequencing, low coverage, you're not interested. Usually, often, sometimes, um, you're, it's a discovery thing. You're not so much worried about your sensitivity and specificity. If you have to go reanalyze the samples, that's fine. You know, come back six months later. In clinical next generation sequencing, you need high enough coverage that have a very low false positive rate and a very high positive predictive value. That means you have to have high sensitivity and specificity. And the way you get that is you have a very high coverage. And when we say a thousand fold coverage, that means there are at least a thousand different DNA sequence reads for each base that are contained that are contained within the region you're looking at. So 20 to 30 fold coverage would mean you only have an average of 20 to 30 different reads that have the base you're interested in. Here we wanted we targeted at least a thousand fold, and and I'll come back to why we targeted a thousand fold um, in a couple in a couple minutes. Um, smaller number of genes. Again, you can go genome wide if you're interested. If you're interested, the reality is insurance companies aren't paying for that now, and so we focused on a smaller number of genes because actually insurance companies are interested in paying for information that has a role in patient care. And it doesn't do any good if you provide 3 billion bases of sequence if only 5 genes or 20 genes have a role in patient care. That's what they're going to pay for, and you can achieve some um, efficiencies cost-wise by focusing on those genes. Must detect a full spectrum of mutations. 
and heterogeneous tissue. You know, a lot of times in, in a lab, people are looking at a cell line, right? They're looking at a, um, um, a variable characterized sample. And it turns out that in clinical practice, if you're looking at cancer, right, we all know, those of us who do surgical pathology, that there's a mixture of other uh, cell types in there. So we had to be able to find mutations um, when they weren't present in 100% of the cells. And the full spectrum of mutations, we realized this very early on when we talked to our clinical colleagues, we were setting up what our reports would look like. And they assumed that we were going to report on what we, again, glibly refer to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The four classes of mutations, single nucleotide variants, single base per substitution, copy number variations, small insertions and deletions, that would be things that are less than about a kilobase, and then larger insertions and deletions and other structural variants, which we call structural variants. So you need a bioinformatic pipeline that can find all of those. You must be able to work with hormone fixed paraffin embedded tissue and psychology specimens, and this is the big one. You have to be reimbursed the insurance companies rather than grants. And again, disclosure, again, this is our bias. There are other institutions that do this, that use uh, grant funding directly or indirectly, or a foundation, or institutional money, okay, to get reimbursed for the testing that they do that insurance companies want to pay for. Since we were focused on getting paid for what we do, that feeds back to the full spectrum mutations and the smaller number of genes, okay? Now, so here's how we designed our panel right out of the gate, okay? <clears throat> We chose an oncology panel, not a constitutional disease panel. Why is that? Well, again, we leverage the institutional expertise. We have, as you know, a, a research at academic medical center. We have the Stanton Cancer Center there, which is, you know, one of the only cancer centers, you know, between Chicago and, and Texas and, and basically Vanderbilt and, and, um, and Colorado, Denver. So we have this huge encashment area. And so we wanted to leverage the institutional expertise. Turns out that based on the volumes that we had, the largest potential um, volume base was in cancer. Yes, we have people at WashU who are studying congenital deafness or congenital blindness or this disease or that disease, but the volumes simply weren't there to support the testing that we wanted to do. So we started with an oncology panel. Our original panel had 27 genes, uh, version two panel that we rolled out in February has 40 genes. The increase reflects the fact that our users have told us other genes that they would find helpful, and in the interim, evidence-based medicine has appeared. Clinical trials have been reported to support the role of certain genes um, uh, in directing therapy. So they all had to have an established role for diagnosis, prognosis, or therapy, and again, that's so we can get reimbursed. For each gene, the target region, that means the area that we sequence, includes the exons, a little bit of upstream and downstream sequence of the introns, and that's so we can detect splice site mutations, which, as you know, can change um, splicing and expression of uh, genes and their, their function of the encoded protein. Okay, and then um, we targeted a thousand-fold depth of coverage, and again, we had to make sure we got <coughs> reimbursed. Now, this isn't really the full story here. Um, there are, as you know, a number of different translocations that actually play a role not only in diagnosis, but provide some information for therapy. And so there are some genes that we also include the introns where we know translocations uh, occur on a, re uh, um, on a recurrent basis. So, for example, that would be certain areas of the red gene, certain areas of the MLL gene. So it's not that for some genes we also include um, um, non-coding regions. Why not? All so you put it all together on a 40-gene panel with some genes in the background. It turns out it's about 800 or 900 kilobases. All right, this allows us, um, you know, to capture enough regions that we can actually get a thousandfold depth of coverage while still multiplexing samples within the same length to achieve some, um, some economies of scale. And here are the genes that are in our currently, um, our version two of our comprehensive cancer set. Uh, you'll notice that, um, that there's some overlap between hematologic malignancies, as you all, I'm sure, know that there's a very active group in AML and other hematologic malignancies and, and dysgracious and things that wash you, so we targeted it for those folks. Solid tumors, and then there's a little bit of overlap here. Um, I, I apologize if your favorite gene isn't up here. Um, I'm sure it soon will be, but it's just not getting paid for yet. And then for those of you in the audience who have picked up on the fact that we're rig rigidly focused on getting paid, and we get paid for genes for which there is a therapeutic implication, meaning they're the targets of therapies. For those of you who are paying attention, you're going to say, wait a second, John, that doesn't make sense. Here's TP53, and here's RB1. There are no drugs to target those. 
Well, this is the intersection between designing a lab test that has clinical utility and marketing a lab test to clinicians who will actually use it. It's pretty hard to go to your clinical colleagues and say, well, we have this, this test. It's a comprehensive cancer set. And they look at it and they say, well, it can't be a cancer set. It doesn't have RB1 or P53. You say, yeah, but you know there are no drugs to treat that, right? Yeah, but you can't have a cancer set. It doesn't have P53. So we find they wore us down. So in version two, we put those in there just, you know, just for marketing. I mean, that's the bottom line, all right? So you have to know your audience at some level. One of the things we've also included is some pharmacogenomic gene, or pharmacogenetic genes in here. One of the things our clinical colleagues told us is that some dosing of some of the drugs that you give to treat certain diseases, um, which are our, tar our panel targets, actually um, the, the dosing is influenced by certain um, you know, hepatic enzymes. And so they wanted us to include those. And we have, we're going to roll this out hopefully uh, in June. I can tell you why the bioinformatics of these genes, they're in our panel, we just don't report them yet. Uh, I can tell you why the bioinformatics of this pr produces some uh, some specific challenges. I mean, it's pretty straightforward how to solve them. It's just the bioinformatics are different than they are for these genes. All right. And so at the same time that we do these 40 genes, I talked about how these machines can make, you know, billions of base pairs of sequence. The 40 genes that we had in our panel that we that we report on, um, they're, not, they're not optimally utilizing the real estate that we have available when we do the sequencing, the throughput that we have available. And so what we did in the background is we've added 108 other genes in the background. Now, some of these genes are in there because for quality control reasons. We know what we should be getting, and so they're in there as a way for us to do QA, QC. Some of the genes are in here. They're the, they're the, uh, there are some mTOR inhibitors, drugs that are out there that we know that are present in phase two or phase two trials. And so we have them in here. So the minute those trials are published, we can essentially flip the switch in our bioinformatic pipeline and pop them up here. One of them is... Um, um, oh, that we're just going to do on Monday. I can't find it here. Well, anyway, so we're going to do that with, with one of these genes on. Uh, it's not Ross, is it? No, it's not Ross. Well, anyway, so, so the point, and there's some other genes here that have to do with pharmaco, pharmacogenetics. So we, we've essentially built in some genes that we expect are going to pop up here in the next um, 12 months. And then a lot of these are research genes. They're in pathways that are signaling pathways for the ones in the, in the pain. And the reason we put those there is, since we're collecting this information, if someone has an IRB protocol, they can actually go in and look at these data. So with the, with the right credentials, even though we don't report these genes, they can go in there and look at them. And so this is in some ways leveraging um, the high throughput capacity of these machines to provide sequence that researchers may be interested in, but insurance companies are not willing to pay for. All right. So how long does this take? Well, the minimum turnaround time is about two weeks. And we can't really control this. All right? There's a one-day pathologist review. A pathologist looks at every single one of our cases to make sure there's viable tumor in there, marks the areas of high cellularity. It takes about three to four days to do the library construction. We have some automation in our lab. It turns out that automation saves money, but it doesn't necessarily, the automation that's available today, save that much time. It takes a couple days to actually do the targeted enrichment. Again, we're not doing the whole genomes. We're doing uh, specific targeted regions. The actual sequencing occurs overnight, okay? So from the, the machine is loaded, you know, during the day, and by the next afternoon, the sequence files are ready to go. The read map and gradient detection, that takes one day. That's all automated, our bioinformatic pipeline. I'll talk about that in a second. And then the main review and reporting. We have it set up in the same model that you do in surgical pathology. The reports come off, the resident or the fellow looks at them, looks at the pre-templated report, massages it, then brings it to sign out, and then the attendant signs it out. This is optimal. It turns out that the biggest time in all of this, I didn't even put on the slide, and the most variable time in all of this, is the time to get the blocks, all right? It turns out in our shop, <laughs> most of those cases take between five days and 15 days to get the blocks. Remember, like you folks, we are a tertiary care academic referral medical center. Most of the patients that we test come to our oncologist from an outside institution, and so we have to track down those blocks, all right? Again, we rarely get them in under five days, but we occasionally get them after 15 days. That's the problem. Because when the clinician orders the test, he or she starts their clock, starts his or her clock when the test is ordered. Unfortunately, our clock doesn't start for a week or two weeks until we get the specimen. 
So even though we really work hard to get our internal turnaround time down to about two weeks or so, these reports are still looking to them like the testing is taking a month or more. All right, so that's a lesson that we learned in all of this. Now, so that's the background of how we set this up at, at WashU, at, at GPS. Now, what I want to do is I want to go through and tell you so that's sort of the structure. Conceptually, we had to get paid for what we do. These are genes we were going to target, how we conceptually set up uh, the test we were going to do. Now, I'm going to go through and tell you a little bit about a bioinformatic pipeline, because this is where the rubber really hits the road. All right? I told you before that if you wanted to get, you know, JR's genome, you have, you know, 90 two well known sets of uh, rosei. To, to call through at the end of the day, if you were doing a whole genome, it would only be about one volume or so that we'd be interested, would be variants in him, and then you have to sort through those variants and find the one, ones that were disease causing. So the bioinformatics is very, is very, um, is very complex, and it all depends in a clinical setting on issues that don't occur in the research phases. And I'm going to walk you through some of those. So this is something that all of us who do surgical pathology are aware of, that a bulk of a tumor is not comprised of tumor cells, all right? So if you actually go through this, this, and you count the areas that are tumor nuclei and that aren't, and I've actually done that on this image, it turns out that only about 30% of the nuclei in this section are actually tumor cells. So when we say we target a thousand-fold depth of coverage, what we're really saying for this case is we're going to get 300 reads from the tumor. And now if the mutation is present in a heterozygous state, we're only going to get 150 reads that harbor the mutation. All right? So the reason we set up a sequencing um, pair, or, um, cutoff of a thousand-fold depth of coverage is we wanted to be able to find mutations that were present in a heterozygous state when tumor cellularity was 20%. Okay, that means we get 100 reads. And that's a long way of saying we tuned our bioinformatic pipeline so that we can find mutations that are present at 10%. Now, why 10%? Well, in talking to our clinical colleagues, they're not quite sure what they should do if we tell them the mutation is only present at 1% or 2%. We have our bioinformatic pipeline tuned so that we can find mutations statistically, I mean with confidence, that are present in a fraction of a percent. 0.1% or lower. The problem is that's not clinically useful information to our colleagues. So we tuned our informatic pipeline to provide them information they're interested in. In reality, even though we say we need 20% tumor so that we can tell you, you know, what's present at 10%, in reality, we will analyze cases that have 5 or 10% tumor cellularity, and we will report mutations that are lower than that. We just put a disclaimer and say, you know, we're sure this one is here, but because of these parameters, the sensitivity of our test may be reduced. But there's the point. That's why there's this magical number of a thousand-fold coverage, is so that given the tumor cellularity um, that's present in the many samples, we can report um, what's there. All right. So the very first thing we did in all of this is convince ourselves this, work, this works out of form of its paraffin embedded tissue. About 10 years ago, we published a, a paper on another topic. But as part of our analysis, we looked at the number of cases in an academic tertiary care you know, referral center. What percentage of cases did you actually have fresh tissue, even though WashU has this very active tumor bank? And it turned out to be about 4% of cases. So the reality is, if you're going to do this testing in a clinically relevant way, it has to work out of form of its paraffin embedded tissue. And the remarkable point about all these next generation sequencing techniques is they do. I can talk with you later about, about <clears throat> why that is. It was because the sequence reads essentially are so short. And this graph is just to prove to you that there's more variability in the coverage between genes in our panel than there is between fresh or formally fixed tissue. So the red bars <coughs> are frozen tissue, and the pink, they look pink to you, but they're actually hashed bars, are the paired, the paired formally fixed tissue. So these were lung cancer cases. So we took sections from the same, we took samples from the same tumor, ran them side by side, and you can see that there's virtually, so this is the mean, this is the, uh, what is it, the 25th to 75th percentile. You can see that gene by gene, these curves are relatively, these bars are relatively, uh, are virtually distinguishable. There's more variation in the, num the amount of coverage we get between individual genes than there is uh, within a gene. This, this variation is almost entirely explained by the GC content of um, the area we're trying to sequence. Why GC content? There were a lot of theories. People at one point thought it would have to do with hybridization and this and that. It actually turns out to do with the polymerization. The enzymes that actually manufacture the DNA um, get stuck in areas of high GC content. So there you go. It works out of form of fixed paraffin embedded tissue, which is good because that's our stock and trade. So the next thing we said is, yeah, I know it works. We can make sequence. 
But is there accuracy? You know, what's the accuracy? What's the concordance there? So we did this experiment. There was no <coughs> concordance between single nucleotide variant calls between the form of fixed paraffin embedded tissue and the frozen tissue. On those cases I just showed you, 17 cases, okay, in this papers in press and JMD. So we said, okay, that's pretty good. How come it's only 98%? How come 98.6? How come it's not 100? So we did this experiment. We spent about three years doing this experiment every way you can imagine. Okay, we repeated these samples over and over again. We tried getting higher read, higher depth of cover. We did everything. And then, as usually happens, one of the residents says, you know, maybe that's the correct answer. Maybe that really is the concordance. Okay, maybe what's really going on is since you're sampling different areas of the tumor, by definition, you're looking at tumor heterogeneity. And we all ponder that, and we thought, dang it, he's right. So we did this experiment a different way. We said, what if you take the fresh tissue, the frozen tissue, and analyze that tissue by different means, i.e. by a microarray versus next generation sequencing. And lo and behold, there's 100% concordance there. And the same thing between the fresh form, the FFPE, and the microarray. So in reality, they're 100% concordant. The data you get from form and fixed tissue and the data you get from fresh tissue. And the lack of concordance when you compare them is because you're sampling different regions of the tumor. And this speaks to tumor heterogeneity. All right? This is another reason that we don't have our biochromatic pipeline tuned down to fractions of a percent. Because we know that if we sample different areas of the tumor, even a couple of millimeters away, that we would have more than that variability. Okay? Thus, variants unique, blah, blah, blah. More likely to represent tumor heterogeneity than a sequencing error. Now, another point about single nucleotide variants. <clears throat> The question was, what depth of coverage do we need to impact our sensitivity and specificity? And the red dot here is a positive predictive value, which is essentially specificity. And you can see that very low, at very low coverage depths, probably in the range of 50 to 100 fold coverage, you actually get a positive predictive value that's virtually very close to 100%, meaning if you detect it, it's real. All right? The false positive rate is very, very low. The problem is the sensitivity you need around a thousand fold depth of coverage to get to a sensitivity, okay, that's, that's clinically actionable. Now you're going to look at this and you're going to say, wait a second, John, a 93% sensitivity when your allele frequency is present at 10%? Right. This is where we started three and a half years ago. And we realized that this sensitivity was not clinically actionable. So this is software. GATK software that you can get off the internet that is what people three and a half years ago were using in a research lab. And the point that this makes is what people use in a research setting is good. It's good for a research setting. You can repeat the experiment and come back six months later and say, you know, we need to tune that up and do a little better because we think we're missing stuff. In a clinical setting, you can't do that six months later. You have to have confidence in, in the metrics of your test now. So this graph told us that we needed to tune up all these software packages that people were using in a research setting, we needed to tune them up to actually use them in a clinical setting. And so there are ways to do this. I mean, we have these bioinformatics people, they're very smart, and they go in there and they write some script to, you know, to, to fix this up. But we have this now down to where if we have 100 reads, we are quite sure that our sensitivity is again up around 97 or 98%, which is better than it is for saying. So the reason I say it's better than it is for saying when we take these samples, we run them through our optimized bioinformatic pipeline. In parallel, we test them by Sanger, and we can show that we, we find the mutation more frequently than the lab person who's reading out those Sanger electroparograms does, sort of, you know, in a blinded way. It's just part of normal workflow. So, so this just emphasizes the point that the bioinformatic tools that are out there on a research setting have not been optimized for a clinical setting, and that was something we, we spent um, a lot of time and money doing. Now the next point is, once you have a bio, a, an optimized pipeline for single nucleotide variants, that's all you have. You don't have an optimized pipeline for the other three horsemen. All right. So we did a very interesting experiment. We said, well now that we've got it optimized for SNGs, let's look at indels. So our model system was a set of 24 <coughs> cases with a known foot 3 internal tandem duplication, which is a type of indel. We actually stunk true, full disclosure, I'll tell you anything. <laughs> full disclosure, we had a tuned bioinformatic pipeline, and we put through some of these cases just, just as part of you know, our, our, our process. And they kept coming back negative, and this was Eric on Cage. And Eric said, you know, we have a problem with this, because these are cases that we know from other testing 
that have this ITV, this internal time duplication, this end up. And we can't find them. So we put through a couple cases that we couldn't find it. And we said, yeah, well, maybe there's some, something funny. Put through a few more. So we put through a whole bunch more. And we reproducibly couldn't find it. And so we tried a number of different programs that are out there that at least they don't really claim, but nobody disclaims that they're not very good for finding insertions and deletions. And at least some of them claim that they can. All right? And so red here means how many out of 24 were found? The red means zero. Okay? So this isn't just not good. It's actually bad. All right? Zero of 24. So we recognize that the indel, the, these indel callers out there are not, again, optimized for clinical specimens. So what we did is we had our bioinformatics folks come in and tune this up, and they said, okay, this is PCR. Pendle is one of these programs that looks pretty good, except it missed one. Well, assembly is a different, it's a software package that actually aligns the reads in a different way. And if you feed, if you use assembly and then feed that into Pendle, then you can find them all. <coughs> If, if you want to know about the details of this, I can tell you about this. This is just intended to emphasize that when you do next generation sequencing, you have to optimize your bioinformatic pipeline for each class of mutations, and that the software programs that you can buy or that are out there that you can get as freeware are not optimized for clinical use. The good news is there are a number of private companies that have picked up on this and academic institutions like us that have picked up on this, and so the software keeps getting better and better all the time. I expect that within another year or 18 months, most of these issues will be solved and they will go away and, and you'll be able to buy software or license software that, that does things very well. So the same thing is true for structural variants, okay, translocation of large insertions or deletions, and the same thing is true for copy number variants. You can optimize, you have to optimize your bioinformatic pipeline because the tools that are out there sim currently um, simply don't give you the clinical metrics that are necessary in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Why is that important? Well, about 5 to 10% of genomic variation in malignancy is accounted for by copy number variants or structural variants, right? And there are drugs out there that target the copy number changes or the translocation. So this is, this is not just an academic exercise. It's clinically important. Now, what does all this mean? What all this means is at the end of the day, the way we set this up in our lab is as follows. There's pathology assessment and accession. Every case that comes in is viewed by a surgical pathologist where we mark and track the amount of tumor cellularity and the amount of tumor um, viability. This is different than some labs out there that do this testing. There are labs out there who you can send samples to who simply take a scroll and actually do the sequencing. In our hands, we know that about 18% of the time specimens are QNS, quantity not sufficient for testing. And a large percentage of those cases are because there's not enough tumor there. Yeah, there's tumor cells there. In the bone marrow cases, there's a cluster of you know, metastatic you know, lung cancer cells or breast cancer cells. But there's nowhere near enough tumor in there to have any, um, any sense that you can you have the sensitivity <coughs> to determine them. Targeted sequencing. So we do the targeted sequence and we do analysis. In order to do the analysis, we, we built this thing called the Clinical Genomicist Workstation. It's basically a scaffold that runs our bioinformatic pipeline in an automated way so that a, a computer science major or you know, some bioinformatician doesn't have to take the, the files that come off the sequencing machine, put them through the GATK, take that output, put that to Pindle, take that output, do something else with it, then run assembly. It's all automated, okay? And so tier one is automated, the base column, the alignment, and calling the variants. Tier two is the clinical annotation. That means you have this variant, you have a sequence change, a single base pair change, in codon 600 of BRAF, what does that mean? So it compares that sequence to the medical literature. We have two people whose job it is at any given time, they're full time, to call the medical literature. We have a software program that calls the medical literature and is actually constantly updating our annotation database, which currently is a spreadsheet that has about 5,000 lines in it, 5,000 individual mutations that we actually have annotated. And then tier three is the clinical interpretation, which is somebody, one of the seven dwarfs, we sit there and we look at that report and we actually sign it out and it goes in the patient's chart. And this is um, an important thing for some of you in the audience. Were we to actually use traditional code stacking, which as you know um, went out of phase um, on December 31st, but when we first started doing this, if we were to use traditional code stacking, the cost of our asset would have been $180,000. We knew nobody was going to pay that. And that speaks to the tremendous cost savings that you get through next generation technologies. So we therefore used 
a CPT code that's about eight, that's 8147, which is currently uh, non valued. If you want a number, all I can tell you is that it varies like anything else between institutional payers. Okay? We at, at WashU are obligated to take the reimbursement by any of the 140 carriers that WashU has contracts with. And depending on the carrier, we will make as low as $2,000 or so, sometimes over $9,000 on this. It's a far cry from $180,000 that um, would be charged by conventional methods to do the testing um, that we do. Now, operationally, we do the pre-certification. Pre-certification is only required on about 45% um, uh, of cases. And thus far, if, I just looked at this data. If you look at a cross-section of where we are now, about 88% of patients have been paid. There, it's been denied about 5%, and we're in the process of, you know, it takes a while for these things to circle back. Um, on about 7%, if you look at cases that we did six months ago where sort of the billing cycle was completed, we ended, up, we ended up getting paid in about 95% of cases. And that's an important number. Remember, I told you, just, I told you that we set this up to get reimbursed, to be sustainable. And the model of doing it, a fine set of genes, whereby you're doing testing on genes that have immediate diagnostic prognostic therapeutic implications that can be used to direct therapy that insurance companies would reimburse for that turns out to be true. Now the last thing I want to do, and I have in, in the last three or four minutes, is take you through the proof is in the pudding part of this to, to show you how this testing actually has an impact on patient care. So the first case is this is the very first case we did, a patient with non-small cell lung cancer, okay? And the answer is we found no probable pathogenic mutations in any of the analyzed genes. This was the very first case we did. We were over two years into this, we ran this case, and we got nothing, okay? Now, I actually spin that up a, a slightly different way. I say that we didn't find any actionable mutations, but we also showed that in the 27 genes there were no actionable mutations, and so the patient should be treated with specific drugs. We got this result, we issued that report, and within two hours I was on a plane to France. No, I was not leaving the country. It just worked out that way. But during the time I was in the air, I got three emails from the oncologist who had this patient. The first email was the one I expected. Well, okay, we had to start somewhere. You know, well, okay. The second one was, you know, this is very interesting. This is very interesting. I know the drugs that I don't, that I shouldn't give. They're not going to have any result. And the third email was, so remember, this is him thinking over about a seven or eight hour period of time. He said, you know, this is fantastic. He said, I would have spent two or three months working through these genes sequentially, one by one, trying to figure out how to treat this patient. Now I know what drugs aren't going to work. Now I know which trials, actually, she's not going to be a candidate for. And so I can move her to a trial instantly that, that actually is going to help her. So again, even in the absence of finding a targeted mutation, there's, all, there's still actionable intelligence. Next, this is a very interesting case. A woman with um, widely metastatic squamous carcinoma of thymic origin. Okay, so she had a long treatment odyssey. She got to the point where now she had rapidly progressing mediastinal liver disease, and so they ordered the testing. And what we actually found was a mutation in kit, in exon 11 C kit, of the type of mutation where present in GI stromal tumors would be treated with a magnet. So we went to the, the oncologist and we said, here's the result. So the oncologist actually treated the patient with, with a madam all right? And here's the result. We are now actually, it's not 10 months, we're now a year out. This was a woman, if you look at the size of her tumor, so, so first of all, before treatment, after treatment, you can see that her tumor shrunk by not even a third, okay? And you're going to say, yeah, it's not a very big response. Except that she was in, she was really uh, very sick because it's not so much the size of the tumor, it's where it is. And this was right above her heart. It was impinging on her superior vena cava. She was actually having, you know, cardiac return issues. So it wasn't so much the size of the tumor, it's where it was. And so the fact that the tumor shrunk a little bit has relieved her symptoms, and she's now a year out, all right, on a matinee doing well. So, yes, there are papers out there that were people have described thyroid tumors and FCT mutations, but they've also described RAS mutations, and they've also described P53 mutations, and they've also described whatever. So it would have been very difficult in this patient, a priori, to know where to start the testing, right? But in, by doing the panel, uh, from the get-go, we were able to return a result that actually um, impacted this patient's care. And here's another example of women who had carcinosarcoma, which used to be known as uh, malignant mixed malarian tumor. She had a long treatment odyssey, but finally was at the point where she had very, very, very extensive disease and was about ready to um, was about ready to die. And this is the sort of result 
that you actually expect, you know, more commonly. Is here you have a lot of widespread disease, she's got secondary changes, and then after therapy you can see a lot of this has just melted away. And so she has stable disease now for six months, actually, this slide is a little old, it's now eight months out, she has stable disease. This is one of those cases when I was there when they actually showed her CT scan at the conference, and Jared, I know this is what, what we call the radiologist sign, when they put up the film, and there's such a marked change, interval change, that the first thing they do is check the name to make sure they actually have the right patient. And that happened at this conference. They wanted to make sure this woman was so sick that they, that the radiologist wanted to make sure that this was actually the same patient. Now, I told you that case about the woman with thymic carcinoma. This was the conversation that we had. The payer was willing to pay for the test, the genetic test, but the payer, the insurance company, bought at actually providing the drug. And the payer's argument went like this. What is the randomized prospective double-blind trial, the evidence-based medicine, to show that this drug is actually going to work in this patient's disease? And so I said to the person from the insurance company, it's a good question. I said, we'll set up that trial tomorrow. In 50 years from now, we'll have the an answer. All right? And then that raises this question. Should we have expected the logical paradox paradox of personalized medicine. What I said to the person on that phone call is, at the end of the day, there is, there exists exactly zero randomized prospective clinical trials for any specific patient. Because a patient's tumor will have a unique set of mutations and it will occur in a unique genetic background. All right? So if you think about all the data that we've accumulated so far in organized medicine, we have used a, a, um, a clinical trial paradigm, which has been very useful, don't get me wrong. But we've sort of been complacent. Yeah, the drug works in 20% of patients. We accept that as a positive result. But really, there's 80% of patients it doesn't work with. We understand we're lumping people together, and we have no idea how, which patient group the patient is going to fall into from the outset. So really, what we're doing now is we're simply shining a light on which was all, what was always true, but we just were ignoring. And that is, our clinical trial design to date has been to lump people in the absence of information and to make that fundamental logical mistake, which is an absence of proof is a proof of absence. An absence of proof of the genetic diversity, diversity we have assumed is an absence of any meaning of that. Now we actually have a way to, to um, understand, it, not understand the meaning of it, but at least understand the genetic diversity. And so this is the argument that I can not the argument, the discussion that we had that we have with payers about all of this. And sometimes they respond and sometimes they don't. But this, em this emphasizes this new protocol design um, threshold that we're at. And that is where we need to start doing clinical trials where we recognize the, the intrinsic genetic um, diversity. And do we how do we start um, designing trials that, that, that catch rates that people use the so-called N of one trial? How would we design a trial where we recognize that everybody's an individual, but somehow collect data and do, do a statistical analysis that, that identifies trends or empirical evidence of, of treatment? So, of, of, an, of an improved treatment outcome. So that's where we are. Let me just make one or two points. What is the standard for medical evidence for treatment in one tumor type when a mutation is known to be drug sensitive in another tumor type? You know, we got to take that into account in new trials. And how do we design compassionate care paradigms? It will probably take us five or ten years to sort this out. In the interim, what do you do with that patient with that thymic carcinoma? Right? And so my argument would be um, the absence of proof is not a proof of absence. If we don't know that this patient won't respond, it's, it's worth a therapeutic trial to, to try it. So that's just my own personal bias. I'm not violating or, or trying to sell a particular drug. And then last but not least, here are the people. Um, you know, um, um, Harry Truman. Um, said that the secret to success is to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are, okay? And, and that's the group of people that I've chosen to surround myself with. So I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you for your attention. Yes? Have you been able to estimate your cost per reportable test? There's a lot of factors that go on agents, overhead, personnel, etc. Right, so at the margin, our cost to do this is probably, you know, it, it depends at some level as to how many cases we put in a lane. 
but the actual uh, reagent costs are probably in the 600 to $650 range, just for the capture probes, the clinical chemistry, and all of that. So, you know, then you have to put in the lab overhead and the people and the amortization of the, or the depreciation of the machines and everything. So again, the actual cost of putting this on the machine, depending on the batch we're using and, and the chemistry, probably is only between 10 and $30. The actual sequencing cost, okay, to make the sequence when you put it on the machine. It's it's the library prep, it's the technical time, it's you know, it's all of that other stuff. So so these technologies are incredibly, incredibly cheap. I will say one other thing, we'll wait for another question. This business about when you get these digital reads, I talked about that earlier, you know, with, with Sanger or capillary sequencing, you get the population. One of the things when you do these tests is, you know, we, we end up sequencing cases for which Sanger testing is shown, they have an EGFR mutation or, or something else that the patient responded to treatment. So when you go in there and you sequence these things, you realize that the tumor population isn't homogenous in terms of in terms of harboring mutation. So when you do Sanger sequence and you see the peak there, you say, okay, look, it's got the deletion, it's got the single base per substitution, let's treat the patient with this drug, and the patient gets better. And our assumption has been that the tumor harbors this mutation. Well, it's very clear that that's not true. It's only a subpopulation of the tumor cells that harbor the mutation, right? And so that raises a lot of questions because to me, it raises the question like, well, how does the tumor respond to begin with if, if not of the cell har harbors the mutation? So that's a very interesting, that's a very interesting observation. It suggests why people recur because there are clearly cells there that don't harbor the mutation. It's not that you're ne they're necessarily escaping the effect of the drug. They're not sensitive to it to begin with. And it also suggests that some of the response to these drugs is not targeting individual tumor cells. It's, it's killing some of them, and then you get all those inflammatory mediators, and then you're killing other tumor cells that are there simply because of the inflammatory response. But again, we, you know, the type of data we got from Sanger indicated there was a change. We sort of assumed it was present in all the tumor cells, and it's probably, it's, it's reasonably clear that that's probably not true. So, something else to think about. Yes? Talk about the patent issues, they Right, so, and that's a very good point. Um, we, of course, had the uh, general counsel's office at Washington involved very early on this. There are uh, some uh, patent issues that are minimized because we're an academic institution, we're not for profit. And I think in general it falls in the category of that a lot of private companies know that you can't suck blood from a tournament. And so why go after an academic institution like you have to go for profit lab? Um, other genes, for example, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are not currently in our clinical panel because it's pretty clear that Myriad will try. Um, and so we, we don't have them up there. As you know, on tax day, April 15th, the Supreme Court actually heard this Myriad case. We expect um, you know, a ruling from them in June, and one of two things will happen. The Supreme Court will, will make editorial comment to follow the correct uh, decision and understand that, that, that the patent, that issuing patents for these things was, was incorrect to begin with, and so these things aren't patentable. Or if the Supreme Court says they are, then people will just pay a licensing fee and people on the stock and they're, you know, right. so. But either way, this issue will go away in June, which is what needs to happen. Yes, there was a question. Yeah, that's what we do. So we mark the areas of tumor, right. So we mark the areas of tumor, Okay, and then we, with the guide slide. And then we will either use a one millimeter punch to go in and collect from that area, and or if, uh, depending on the type of case, if it's a cytology specimen that has high cellularity, we'll just do recuts of the tumor. Sometimes if, if the whole slide is tumor, we'll just, we'll just do a recut. How much DNA do you use? How much DNA do you, do you need, actually? Well, it turns out you need about 150 to 200 nanograms to do this test. If it's a cellular tumor, Two one millimeter punches is more than enough to do to do the testing. You don't need a lot of DNA. Let me make one more comment about that. You will read papers, okay, where people do this. There are papers out there where they say they can do this testing from 10 nanograms. or labs out there that say they will do it from 10 nanograms or even one nanogram. And that is clearly possible. You can do this. You know, there are papers out there where you can do it from a single cell. It's clear that you can do it from 10 nanograms of tumor tissue. We can do it in our lab. The problem is the sensitivity and the specificity of the test, all right? We have a paper that, that we submitted where we address this, and it turns out somewhere around 200 nanograms or so, you have very good sensitivity and specificity. But what happens below that is your library complexity falls off, meaning the number of independent molecules that you've sampled 
really falls off a cliff. So by the time you get down to 25 or 10 nanograms, your library complexity is only 3% of what it was at 200 nanograms. And what that means is your sensitivity collapses. And when we look at these data sets that we have, like these lung cancer things, our sensitivity goes to a precisely calculated 0%. Okay? So that's just another point. There are labs out there that, that do this in a for-profit setting that, that don't you know, they're more interested in running the test than actually good QC. They don't, they'll take tissue scrolls at the beginning. Again, seven, I showed you the slide, 17 or 18 percent of our cases we end up not running because they don't pass our metrics, okay? And for some of those cases, we don't have enough DNA to do it because we're interested in giving a clinically, a clinically appropriate result. So, so those are just some sort of little anecdotes about like any lab test. As I said, it's like any lab test. It has a specimen, you know, requirement, and you have to make sure that you pay attention to that. Yes? Oh, good question. So we have a number of cases where the allele frequencies, and I didn't get into that, you know, because it's digital, you can there's all kinds of data out there. Where you look at the allele frequency, so you have a tumor, okay? You have a tumor, it's a, it's a lung cancer um, in a woman, and you look at the tumor and the frequency of the PTM mutation, right? The allele frequency there is way too high. So when you looked at it, you say, well, only 30% of this is cancer, and the allele frequency turns out to be 85 or 90%. And you do the math, and you say, well, this looks like she had a germline mutation in P10, and then the tumor has just actually accumulated another mutation, because you look at P10, and you see there are two different mutations in there, right? So it's a perfect setup for, right, for an inherited cancer syndrome. So what we do in that setting, and that was one of my questions, um, I think, right, does consent for testing need to include formal medical genetics counseling? So what we do in those cases is we call the clinician and we say, you know, this is a little interesting here. There is a possibility that this patient actually has an inherited cancer syndrome. You should follow up with the patient and get a formal medical genetics, you know, consult. And then in our report, we just say something like that and then we say clinical correlation is required. All right. That's a very good point because it's clear that when you do this testing, those patients will be there. This particular patient that I mentioned, it turns out. Um, she was in her late 20s or early 30s, and the clinician said, oh, I can't believe I didn't think about that, because she's already had an osteosarcoma and um, a thyroid cancer. So, so, you know, there, I don't know that next generation sequencing was really required to, <laughs> to raise that possibility, but, you know, in any way, we did, we did highlight that. So that's, that's a great question. Yes? Um, could you comment on uh, this testing for re in recurrence or METs? Ah, excellent question. Excellent question. So, there's two models for that. One of them is that, that the patient, um, and, and this is, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phrase that question a little more broadly. It's just, it raises the reinterpretation question. Okay? So, some people say the following. You have a tumor, a lung cancer, you sequence the tumor, and then, um, and then you find mutations and you treat the patient. And then the patient recurs two years later. So if you reinterpret that first data set, you just go back and say medical literature is advanced, our knowledge base is increased, let's go back and look at those sequences and, and reinterpret the data. That's one thing to do. The reality is it's probably cheaper to just resequence it than it is to, to, to do the reanalysis. Now that's important because I would suggest, what's, I would ask, what's the utility in sequencing the tumor from two years ago now that the patient has recurred? That tumor has undoubtedly undergone clonal evolution, either a clone has grown out or under selective pressure of the treatment that was given. What you need to do instead is sequence the recurrence. And by and large, that is what is done at, at our institution. When the patients recur, they will biopsy the recurrent lesion. So if it's in the skin, for example, they'll biopsy the skin, they'll stick a needle in a new liver lesion. All right? We have our cardiothoracic surgeons have even done VATS on patients to go in to, and get a pulmonary nodule so that we have recurrent tumor to do, to do the sequence. Now think about that. <clears throat> there was a lot of concern a couple years ago that this testing was going to put pathologists out of business, that if pathologists didn't grab a hold of it, other professionals, healthcare professionals, were going to do the testing and interpretation. I told you in our shop that we are going outside of pathologists to help us do the testing. There's so much demand. There aren't enough pathologists to do it. And so really, we're happy there are other people who are trained in that because we need them to, to sign up the cases. I just told you something else. 
And that is that this testing isn't going to decrease the amount of work that pathologists are getting. In our institution, it's actually increased our work because clinicians are now biopsying no metastatic disease, which they never would have biopsied before, only merely to get the tissue so that we can do testing. And since our model is that a pathologist has to review that tissue to make sure that the tumor cellularity is high enough and it's viable, for the testing is actually creating work for surgical pathologists. So the, the sort you know the sort of chicken little the sky is falling concerns three or four years ago have turned out to be to be not only wrong, but you know absolutely, you know, 180 degrees wrong about this. So that, that's very interesting. One last guess. And just to, I mean, we had Teresa, right, just to kind of, again, going along with what you just said, but recently kind of faced a separate problem with Ezra, called mm -hmm. uh, And then they tested the test and said, well, no, it's Right. Ezra, and then my question would be, um, is your biostatic pipeline tested or embedded in the right hand in the pseudogenes? Yes. OK, so pseudogenes are a very interesting question. Pseudogenes has to do with, if, if you get into the workflow, it's, um, it's basically an alignment issue. You have to set your parameters to have enough stringency as to whether or not you know, it, it's going to align a pseudogene with the real gene or a real gene with the pseudogene. That's one of the issues that comes up with these pharmacogenetic genes, is because there's a lot, of, a lot of homology between them. And the answer is, you can overcome that with an increased number of reads and a lot of read length. All right, just so that you can get outside of the regions. And, and some of the bioinformatic like tricks you can do on that is you, you, even though it aligns to a specific region, you have the bioinformatic tool come back and look at the areas, um, um, look at reads that, that there may, um, where the, vari the variation occurs and just put a higher stringency that it has to be 100% accurate in that area and not a lower mapping quality. So we can, we can talk about that, but that is, that's a real issue. That, that comes up, so, it's, but easily solvable. I mean, if the bioinformatic issues that offer, believe me, that that is not the one of the ones I lay awake at night worry about. Okay, because that one's pretty straightforward to fix. Okay, thank you.